Well, it had been 400 years. 400 years since the good old days when their great, 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 great grandpa Joseph was the number two guy in the land and in good standing with the Egyptians. And you know, the only thing that kept those days alive for the people were the stories that got passed down from generation to generation. And boy, would every Israelite mom or dad pass them down daily to their kiddos. They were slaves. Slaves, uh, you know, but they would look at their kids and they would say, you know, children, children, eyes and ears, listen, listen. God's our provider. This is not our home. And one day we're going to go back to the promised land. And if those Israelite kids were anything like my little buddy Nigel, I would sense a follow up question on its way <laughs> Mom, what's the promised land? <laughs> Oh, buddy, you know, it's a special place that God has prepared just for you and just for me and for our people. And one day we're going to go there and we're not going to be slaves anymore. We're going to be completely free. And as they grinded through this treacherous existence, treacherous and persecuted existence, one thing became crystal clear. God's kingdom was bigger than any one of their individual lives. And every pregnant Israelite mom back then would have rubbed her belly and prayed that their little one would get to be the one that would finally taste freedom because so many before them never, ever got the chance to do it. And the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter one that the more the Israelites were oppressed in the land of Egypt, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And they had essentially become a growing nation within a nation, the nation of Egypt, and it terrified the Pharaoh of the time, so much so that he decreed that all the Israelite firstborn males should be killed as soon as they were born. It's a horrible thought to think about. It was a horrible thought to think about then, and it's still a horrible thought to think about today. And the Hebrew midwives at the time, they wouldn't go through with it, if you know the story, and they chose to obey God rather than men at great risk to their own lives. And in doing so, God actually blessed them with families. So the point is this. If there was ever a time in the history of Israel to not want to get pregnant, to not want to have children, man, this was it. And in the midst of all of that and all this trauma and all this nationwide stress, another Israelite mom finds herself with child. But in her womb was not just a child, it was God's plan for the advancement of his kingdom of the Israelite nation at the time. And so my message title today on Mother's Day of 2022 is Kingdom Advancement in Crazy Times. And I'd like to ask everybody to open a Bible to the book of Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. If you don't know where Exodus is, it's the second book in the Bible. Pretty good. You can find that one. Um, and if you didn't bring a Bible, I always encourage you to grab the Version app on your phone and you can find it there. But the reason that I picked this text for today is because today is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all the rest of the moms in the room, the grandmas, the aunties, the spiritual mom-like figures in our lives. We are so grateful for you and happy Mother's Day to my wife. Uh, And by my view, uh, the best of them all. And every husband should feel that way, amen? Now, one of my favorite mom stories in all of the Bible is a mom by the name of Jochebed. She just so happened to be Moses' mom. And inside her womb was the greatest kingdom advancement in the entire Israelite nation in 400 years. She just didn't know it yet. All she knew was that she was about to give birth to a baby in some seriously crazy times. Moms in the room, how many of you have been there? Like, like how many of you had a baby during COVID? Okay, a few of you did. How many of you had a baby while having a heart transplant during COVID? I know at least one of you did. <laughs> um, you know, some of you are about to step into that moment very soon. Some of you uh, might have great grandmas who gave birth in the depression or grandmas who gave birth uh, during the Vietnam War, some other crazy times. You know, imagine being a mom about to give birth in Ukraine right now. 
You know, there have always been uncertain and crazy times to give birth, uh, and, but you women, you're amazing. You just grin and bear it, and you just do it. And in doing so, you keep this world alive. And so Jochebed here in this story was about to raise her second child, but her firstborn son, um, in some serious uncertainty. And she was about to raise a child in a nation whose values radically conflicted with that of her faith. Does any of that sound familiar to, to Americans in 2022? Well, the crazy thing about the times the Israelites face is that they were different than the times that we face today, but the goal is still the same. The goal is to advance God's kingdom in the crazy times that we find ourselves in. Um, and so I'm gonna pray, and then we're gonna read Exodus chapter two, verses one and two. Would you bow your head and your heart with me? God, we thank you for moms. We thank you that from the dawn of time, you saw fit, Lord, that a man and a woman uh, would come together, raise a family, Lord, and, and that you would bring family through mothers. God, we're so grateful for that. We're so grateful for your love. Uh, we're so grateful for children that, uh, Lord, you've given moms to love and, and cherish. And, and Lord, uh, I want to pray right now for those who maybe today is a little bit of a harder day. Maybe their mom's with you. Maybe uh, just things aren't good. The relationship isn't what uh, they'd like it to be. Or maybe they have a dream to be a mom that hasn't yet come true. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd bring a special dose of love and comfort to them today. Jesus, we thank you that you're here. We don't have to invite your spirit, but we do ask, Lord, that you move afresh in our hearts. So open our eyes to see what you want us to see. Open our ears to hear what you want us to hear from your word. And Lord, open our hearts, that we'd respond and become the disciples Jesus wants us to be as a result of having spent time in your word together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read Exodus 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, which I'm sure is what my mom thought when she saw me, um, she hid him three months. Okay, that was a bad joke. I'll move on from there. In verses one and two, we see and we learn that an unnamed man who is later identified as Amram, uh, happened to, who happened to be from the tribe of Levi, um, took an unnamed wife, later identified in Exodus 6.20 as Jochebed, also from the Levite tribe. Now, this, also, this all seems kind of ceremonial and, and introductory, but it actually gives us some important information here. And for the most part, you know, the Levites, they were the spiritual leaders of God's people. They were the ones who taught the Bible. They were the ones who would lead the praise singing. Later on in the story with the tabernacle and the temple, they would do a lot involved with that. And so the fact that these two parents were from this tribe gives us a little bit of an insight into who the man Moses would become. Uh, spiritual leadership was in his blood. And, and I would even say it was in his destiny from God. Now, verse two shows us how hard it was to be an Israelite mom at this time. And and as a baby, Moses opened his eyes to an extremely unfriendly world. Moses was born in a powerful nation, but he was from a foreign and oppressed race during a time when all babies such as himself were under a royal death sentence. And despite all of this, Moses had something very special working in his favor. He was the child of believing parents. And this is clear to me from verses one and two, and it takes me to the first thing that I love for you to jot down today about kingdom advancement in crazy times. And this is it. The most powerful gift that we can give to our kids and the world is to be a believing parent. If you don't have kids, the most powerful gift that you can give to the world is to be a believing person. And you know, the greatest gift that Amram and Jochebed gave to baby Moses was to be believing parents in a culture and in crazy times that they faced. And that foundation of faith uh, that was laid by Amram and Jochebed for Moses led to the greatest kingdom advancement the nation of Israelite had seen, the, uh, the, the nation of the Israelites had seen in 400 years. Let me illustrate this to you by asking everyone to turn in your Bibles to the book of Amram chapter 12. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Book of Yochebed, chapter two. Can you turn there? If you're not chuckling by now, it's probably because you didn't go to Awana's growing up with your sword drills to learn all the books of the Bible. There is no book of Amram in the Bible. There is no book of Yochebed. They're not even mentioned here in Exodus 2. They're briefly mentioned four chapters later in, in Exodus 6 as Moses' parents and just ran, randomly referred to in an ancillary setting. Uh, but that's it later in the Bible. All that hard work, all those stressful and sleepless nights that wondering how they were gonna keep baby Mo alive in these uncertain times and all that they get in scripture uh, was this reference that they were Moses' parents. That's it. But believe it or not, that was the greatest legacy that they could ever leave behind for the entire world. And it was to be the parents of Moses. Listen, if all you can give to your kids is a consistent heart of obedience to God, it is more than enough to change the world. The most powerful gift that you can give to your kids is to be a believing parent. You know, I once heard a, a famous pastor that I follow from time to time by the name of Andy Stanley put it this way. He says that your greatest contribution or advancement to God's kingdom might not be something you do, but rather someone that you raise. You know, it's so good and it's so relevant to this passage. And I have to say that as a parent, I feel the pressure to give only the best to my kids. How many of you parents are willing to admit that? <laughs> you know, when, when we were first time parents, we felt the pressure to only give our baby brand new everything. How many of you first time parents felt that one too? You know, because who knows what disgusting germs lurk beneath those hand-me-downs, you know? Well, we quickly gave up on that idealism once we realized how quickly babies grow, how many clothes they need, and the price tag of new clothes, frankly. And that was several years ago. Um, you know, later, the, the parenting pressure to give your kids only the best shifts a little bit to, you know, I, I need to give my kids a really solid education. That's what I need to do to make sure they're doing well. You know, and some would even say, well, I need to make sure I'm giving them a private ed education. Or Christians would say, a private Christian education. Uh, you know, or, or if it's a public school, okay, but only if it's in an area with the highest rated schools on Zillow, okay? Because Zillow clearly knows what it takes to raise a child in this world today. Man, no, they don't. They know how to sell houses, ads, and capture your personal information to sell to marketing companies. That's what Zillow knows how to do, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm joking here and I'm having a little bit of fun. But you know, the pressure to give your kids only the best is real. You know, you gotta make sure your kids are raised in the right neighborhood. You gotta make sure your kids are signed up for the right sports and gymnastics. You gotta make sure that your kids only go to a church where every aspect of their generational development is specialized and tailored just for them. I hear a few chuckles in there. <laughs> I might be stepping on some toes, I don't know. And you gotta make sure that they're never ever bored at the church that they go to because clearly boredom is a sign of a kid who's not walking with God, right? Okay, I need to back off a little bit here. Listen, all because I'm not willing to sacrifice or compromise for my kids, they're only getting the best. Now, listen up, okay? I'm not against any of those things. In fact, there are amazing things to shoot for if that's what you're able to do. And I was personally blessed to be able to experience all of them. It is a privilege that I can never deny in my life. And if you have the ability to do that for your kids, Ben, that is amazing. You thank God for that. You'd be grateful for that. But you remember that those things are just gifts. And what I'm saying is that the most powerful gift that you can give to your kids, even if you can give them all of those things, is to be a solid, believing parent. See, if you can give all of your kids all of those things or any of those things, but that's not consistent at home, they're gonna struggle to see the, if those things line up with each other. Um, but if you can't give your kids those things or any of those things, but at home you can give them a solid believing mom or dad, you have done more than enough. 
and that is all that God asks of you. And so for me as a parent, what this does is it takes the pressure off just a little bit. Um, you, you know, I'm gonna talk real personally for a minute. Our kids love this church. It is so cool to see God uh, just growing in their hearts, not just a love for him, but a love for this church. And I am so thankful to the Lord for that. But I believe what our kids really want to see more than this church being a great church is for mom and dad to be a great church at home. Um, And they want to see mom and dad be the same here and dad be the same on stage as dad is at home. Um, And as that happens, I think that's when the light bulbs start to go off. And I don't always do it perfectly, okay? In case any of you are wondering, like, I've been to your house. I've heard how you talk to your kids sometimes. I know. Trust me. Some of you are like, no, you don't even do it at home. You do it right here at church. I hear hear you in the courtyard, Pastor Kyle. Dad voice just takes over. You know, I don't know what it is. Does your parents know what I'm talking? It's like, I could be talking and having a nice, normal conversation with some random person. Hey, hey, what are you doing over there? You know what I mean? So I know, I know I'm working on it, okay? (laughs) But see, at the end of my life, the most important thing that I want my kids to know is that they're, or the most important thing that I want to see in my kids is that they're walking with God, (laughs) Because I know if they are walking with God, I'm going to see them one day when I get to the other side. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other things that I hope that I pray for them as well, but that is the most important thing for me. And so I just want to encourage any parent who's in the room today, whether you feel like you have it all or whether you feel like you are barely keeping a roof over your head, the most important gift that you can give to your children is to be a solid, believing parent. And to all of you who don't have kids, perhaps by choice, perhaps not, I want to encourage you that the most powerful way that you can advance the kingdom of God is simply to be a a person of obedient faith. And, you know, maybe leave hope and the door open that one day you will have kids if that's in your heart. But even if that's not the case, the same principle still applies to every single one of us in terms of our impact upon the world, that what the world needs most is a solid you who believes in Jesus Christ and lives for him. And with that foundation, anything is possible. Now let's read verses three through six in Exodus chapter two. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. I'll push pause right there. What we just read was Moses' mom essentially doing the same thing that the Israelite uh, midwives did in Exodus chapter one, if you know the story. Um, And she crafted this cunning plan here, essentially lying to the authorities to protect the life of her son. And and she was surrounded surrounded in this moment by nothing but bad choices. If they found her son, they would kill him. She would get killed as a slave if she ran, and she wouldn't get far running in the hot desert. Um, And so her best bad choice was to take this child, make a little boat, and put her three to four month old inside of it, and hope that someone important saw the boat, rescued the child inside of it, and that he has that chance to live as a result. So So this takes me to the next point that I'd like all of us to jot down about kingdom advancement in crazy times. You know, sometimes the best thing we can do to advance God's kingdom is to make the best bad choice. (laughs) Now make no mistake, friends, putting a newborn into an actively flowing river, especially like the Nile, was a very bad choice, okay? but it was the best bad choice that she had available to her at the time. I'm 100% sure that if Yochebed happened to have had a better option to save her kid's life, uh, she would absolutely have taken that option. And I'm confident saying that because the text shows us so many things that Yochebed did to protect that kid and to give him a fighting chance at life. Uh, You know, she uh, kept him hidden as long as she possibly, well, first she kept the pregnancy quiet, then she kept him hidden as long as she possibly could. And when there finally came a point where she just couldn't hide the baby, 
baby anymore. She did something uh, that all of us would probably describe as absolutely crazy. She built a little basket that floated. She strategically placed her three to four month old inside of it. And she trusted God with his life as it floated in the river. Now, I got to give a little bit of a disclaimer here, okay? A story like this in modern times today would definitely have landed Yochebed with a solid visit from Child Protective Services. And this is why it's important to be able to distinguish when the Bible is being descriptive and when the Bible is being prescriptive. <laughs> Don't take any parenting tips from Yochebed here, okay? She was definitely being, the Bible is definitely being descriptive about what she did. But this highly calculated, dangerous, bad choice wound up being the very best bad choice that Yochebed had available to her at the time. And as we read the story, we realize the intentionality, really, of every single detail that Yochebed took, uh, you know, she placed him right at a spot where he would be the most likely to encounter a high-ranking Egyptian official. Yochebed knew uh, where the Egyptian women and the high-ranking Egyptian women specifically bathed. And she knew that if just one of those high-ranking officials saw her child crying in the reeds in the water there, that 99.99% of women in the world would pick that child up uh, and rescue it, no matter what creed or background that child came from. And they would never be able to put that child back down in the river. She knew that fact. And so the very best thing that Yochebed could do to advance God's kingdom was to make her best bad choice that was right there in front of her. You know, I want to ask a question in your own heart. This isn't a show of hands, but I wonder how many of you have ever felt like the only choices in front of you were bad and you had to make the best bad choice that was in front of you. You know, do I break up with this guy or, or this girl that I'm dating because they're not a Christian and I know that God says that I should, should wind up with the believer, but I also know that means I'm gonna wind up being alone at the end of it. Uh, you know, again, there's, there's no guarantees of a future relationship, but I know this is what God's asking me to do. Do I try to resolve this relational conflict with this person even though I know it's probably gonna repeat itself or do I just let them fade into the distance of my life and hope it goes away? Do I stay at this job that I don't like even though it provides well for me and for my family? Or do I just drop it and, and, and risk, you know, winding up somewhere else in the future where I might make less money or maybe even worse, no money? Do I go back to school, uh, even though it's going to mean the end of personal freedom for a big chunk of my life? Or do I just keep doing what I'm doing and try my best to be happy with it? You know, do I hang on to my struggling business that I have or do I let it go and choose to do something else? Do I move forward with this medical situation, this treatment, uh, even though it's got some gnarly side effects and, you know, may not be that great? Or uh, do I accept it at where I'm at, live with what I've got and hope for the best? You know, here's the point I'm getting at. You can insert your own situation in I'm sure you all have your own. Sometimes life only hands us bad choices. And I feel sometimes like I'm like, God, I'd like to select E, none of the above. <laughs> but the question is, what do you do in your life when the only choices in front of you are bad? Sometimes we just have to make the best bad choice that's possible. And the best bad choice, just real quick, is the one, number one, that is in line with the word of God. Um, and, and secondly, the best bad choice in front of us is often affirmed by godly men and women who are around us, who love God and who love us. And the other thing I want you to know about the best bad choice is it is usually not easy. One of my pastor's friends told me that for him, when he thinks about the best bad choices that he has to make, another thing is he, that he tries to pass is what he calls the peace test. Uh, the one that the Lord puts uh, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding in your heart that says, this is not going to be easy, uh, but Lord, I sense that this is the direction that you're wanting me to go. Last week, Pastor Chris, if you were here, if you, if you didn't, you didn't hear the message, you need to. It was phenomenal. But he talked about creating a right picture of Jesus that is not always sunshine and rainbows. And friends, this is a huge part, in my opinion, of how we paint that right picture, that sometimes advancing God's kingdom is super positive and it's full of great options, but sometimes it's not. And all we can do is make the best bad choice that's in front of us. But here's the crazy thing about Yochebed's story. 
it worked. (laughs) And not only did it work, but it put baby Moses in front of Pharaoh's daughter, no less. And the daughter reacted exactly the way that Jochebed had prayed and hoped for. Let's read verses 7 through 10. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And so the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. So not only did the plan to put Moses in front of Pharaoh's daughter work, but but then when Pharaoh's daughter found uh, Moses there, Moses' sister, sister also happens to have strategically just appeared. It's just like, bing, there she is in the middle of this whole thing. And, and you know, today, uh, that would be a little bit like your kid winding up in the same playground as the president of the United States' kid. I mean, you could not even get anywhere close to that, that kid. And yet here in this story, that's exactly what we see that happened. Um, and, and so this takes me to the next point that's there on your note sheet. There comes a point when the best way to advance God's kingdom is simply to let go. It's simply to let go. You see, there came this point where no matter how much she had planned and prepared for all of these things, she had to sit there and place her baby into that boat and take her hands off of the baby. And you know, the Bible doesn't describe for us the final words that Jochebed told baby Moses before she uh, put him into the boat. But I know this, if it were me, it would probably be something like this. Baby, I love you. (laughs) All that mom and dad ever wanted was to be your parent. I remember the very first day that we found out we were going to be parents. It was the best day when we knew that you were coming into our lives. I remember when you came out for the first time and I heard you cry and I didn't know what to do, and I felt so overwhelmed. (laughs) And I remember that very first moment when you soothed to the sound of my voice. Baby, what I'm gonna do right now doesn't make sense to me, and I'm, I'm sure it doesn't make any sense to you, but God tells me that he's got a hope for you, that he's got a future for you. And so now it's time for me to let you go and let God be the king of your life. God is your hope. God is your future. Oh, Lord, take this child now. Use them. Lord, they weren't mine in the first place. Now I give them back to you. And then she puts him down and places him into that boat and backs up. Mom's in the room. Can you imagine that moment? You know, I'm Now, maybe for me, you know, by the time you get to baby number three or four, you just throw them in. I don't know how it goes. But but for this one, man, she was still concerned in that moment. And and in letting go of control in that moment, you know, Jochebed advanced God's kingdom for the Israelites further than anyone had done in 400 years. You see, what I want to communicate to all of us today is that sometimes the greatest way to advance the kingdom of God in our midst is to let go. So I have to ask us all a question today. What do you need to put in God's boat and let go of? Is it a friendship that you're trying to rescue? Is it uh, uh, your finances and, and doing them your way and controlling it the way you feel you need to? Is it control of your kids? Maybe it's just control in general. <laughs> Is it idealism and everything having to be perfect in exactly the right way or else nothing good is going to happen? Is it debt and, and living your life uh, a slave to someone else? Is it doubt? Uh, is it fear? Is there unforgiveness that you need to put in God's boat? Is it pride? I don't know what it is for you, but here is something that I have personally learned in my own life. God doesn't advance what I don't let go. 
and I've got to put it in his hands first for God to take it and transform it and use it. And you know, friends, I want to tell you that we are not living in Moses's days. We are not living in Jesus's days anymore, uh, but we still live in some crazy, uncertain times today. And, and the circumstances and the situations look different, but what God wants from us is still the same. He wants us to be believing people and he wants us to be believing parents in this very broken world. God wants us to make the very best bad choices in this broken world that are given in front of us. God wants us to let go of whatever we're holding on to so that he can take it and he can turn it into something far, far greater. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you still are a God who advances your kingdom in crazy uncertain times. I pray today for anyone in here who's struggling to let go of something. And deep down, we want to, but we don't know how. Lord, help us. Help us to take our hands off the wheel. Help us to put that situation, that circumstance, or that struggle in the boat with you. Lord, we thank you for all those times in our lives when we've faithfully seen you take and turn things in our lives and use them for the good. And so we pray yet again that you would do it today. You know, and if you're here today and you've been window shopping God, the Bible, and the claims of Christianity, and either you to walk out this church today or you turn off the screen and you genuinely don't know if you'd go to heaven when you die, I want to tell you that God promises to do four things for you. He promises to forgive you of all your sin. He promises to adopt you into his family. He promises to fill you with his Holy Spirit so you can live the life that he's promised for you. And finally, he offers you an eternal life with him. That promise that at the end of your days, you're going to go be with him. And so we'll, you'll join those who, who have also gone before you. But if you've never made that choice yourself, I believe God brought you here to settle it once and for all. You know, it's not mystical. It's not magical. God brought you here today to settle the question. All he asks is that we respond to him in faith. And so I'm going to give you a chance right now to respond to God in faith and say yes in your heart to Jesus today. If that's you, would you bow your head and your heart and pray this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin and the sins of the world. I believe you died there, and I believe you rose from the grave so I could have everlasting life. Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me the power to live this life for you. God, I'm tired of running. Here's the steering wheel of my heart. Would you take over? In Jesus' name, amen.